Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 7.25. We'll have the papers in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. Well, Arsenal missed their chance to go top of the Premier League last night following a lacklustre performance against West Ham. Johnny Gould will be here to round up the action before 8. And at 8.15, we'll be live in Stalybridge to find out how people there are recovering from yesterday's tornado that damaged around 100 homes. And before 9, amid a rise in anti-Semitic attacks since the war in Gaza began, we'll speak to a rabbi about how safe his community currently feels. Let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages now. The Times reports on a culture of over-promoting in civil service, claiming staff are moved to senior jobs before they're ready in order to get around the Whitehall pay squeeze. Police are giving up on four crimes a minute, according to Home Office figures in the mail. That's equivalent to more than 6,000 per day. And The Sun reports on a costly break-in at the home of Man City and England star Jack Grelish, where thieves stole up to a million pounds worth of jewellery. Well, journalist and author Emma Wolfe and the entrepreneur Will Hodson join us now for a quick canter through this morning's papers. Uh, let's have a look at the Times front page. Uh, Emma, civil servants being promoted, over-promoted, to get yeah. round Whitehall pay squeeze. Yeah, so this is the latest kind of clever wheeze coming out of Whitehall. Um, if you can't pay people more, if you're under, you know, budgetary constraints and you have a pay freeze, you just over-promote people who are actually <laughs> underqualified. So we end up paying more for overqualified staff um, and not getting the quality of civil servant that we need. So is this a way to pay them the same but just give them um, a promotion or do they get the pay rise that comes so with they, the promotion? They get the pay rise that comes from the promotion. So it still promotion. ends up costing it more? It costs us a lot. It's costing us around £1.5 billion a year in grade inflation. And to add insult to injury, the problem is the more senior people are sort of getting stuck at the top, they're leaving the civil service and going to, into the private sector. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a mess. Um, if, we are to, if we believe what we read, also, you know, civil servants don't want to go into the office more than about three days a week, yeah. like two or three days a week. Empty desks across Whitehall, all of that stuff that we've heard from Rhys Mogg and Boris Johnson talking about you know, people needing to get back to work. So it does look like the civil service at the moment is not really, it's not really performing. Well, is the civil service a sort of convenient punch bag? You know, but lots of politicians like to criticise them, like to say, oh, you know, it's the blob, it's the civil service that won't let me get my policy through. You know, mm. if only it wasn't for these pesky <laughs> civil servants, everything would run properly. You know, or, so are they a bit of a convenient punch bag or do you think they are a block to reform? Uh, I, th I think they're possibly both. Um, I know people who have gone into government over the last 10 years with truly radical agendas, and they've come up against the civil service who have seen things done a certain way for a long time and provide a bit of pushback. Now, here's the news flash. That's probably a good thing. With the instability we've had in government over the last decade, since I saw my pals going and trying to do this, you have to have some kind of relief that, in fact, there are people there who know how things work and have been there before. So I think we need to cool it a little bit on the attacks, all our attacks on the civil service. We've got a good civil service in this country. We should be grateful for it. Yeah, I, I, I've got to agree with Daisy on this one. I think this is a blob, the criticism of, of them, because we, we, we need to have some radical change. And I think if you've got people who are going to be sticking to the old the old rule, the old school, it's almost like this old boys club of, exactly. this is how we do things, we don't want anything new coming through. And, and, and we've heard, you know, insiders from the Home Office saying that the whole, the government's whole agenda on migration and cracking down on that was never going to work, that people were never behind it. Mm. And that is a really, you know, that's one of the most serious issues facing the country at the moment. So I think there's nothing wrong with radical change. You know, we can't just go on oh, this is how things have always been done. It just mm. simply doesn't, you know, it doesn't get things done. I, so in my defence, I would say it's a sticking... <laughs> generally, you've got them, they've always had this since day zero. You've got them trying to manage the wishes of the government of the day who reflect the wishes of the people. Um, I just think having a bit of experience and an experienced hand on the tiller is a good thing. One area where I do agree with you guys is when you have particularly contentious issues, immigration is a really good example. If you have a civil service who are concentrated in one part of the country and largely drawn from one pool of educational background, mm -hmm. they can find themselves out of touch with the population more generally. That is a danger. Well, talk to us about the front page of the Daily Mail. Mm. Police mm. not policing again. Police not policing again. So we can all agree that crime is bad, but what's even worse is people getting away with crime. And mm -hmm. you've got the chief of policy exchange saying, we are seeing in Britain a culture of impunity that is emboldening lawbreakers. And the Daily Mails have got the statistics behind that. So, 
what we've seen is inquiries close without police identifying a suspect. That's the number we're looking for. Mm -hmm. It's gone up by nearly a quarter of a million over the last year. So wow. it's gone from about 2 million to 2.3 million. Now, this is in particularly uh, frustrating because the police have seen an increase in their funding. In terms of numbers of police officers, we've gone from 130,000 in 2020 to 150,000 in 2023. So the heat is going to come on to the police to explain why, with more money, they're doing a worse job. And, and the other thing that it doesn't um, give you the full picture in is that crime is actually down. That's, crime a, is sti down. that's a statistic Burglaries. that nobody believes because the number of crimes being solved mm. is, is, is massively down. But overall, crime, there sh it should be a good news just, story. Just yesterday, with the, with the um, headlines about police should investigate burglaries within the first hour, that golden hour when you can really get into the kind of nit yeah. you know, the nuts and bolts mm. of a burglary. But burglary crimes are down about 80% from the 1990s. I think it's a complicated matter because you've got more evidence. You've got, like, door cameras. You've got all sorts yeah. of other evidence. You've got other crimes. You've got online mm. crime. You've got cyber crime. Forensics is better. Yeah, so yeah. On. But I do think, in general, the loss of, of, of confidence in the police. Mm. People are often not reporting crimes. What is the point of reporting a burglary when you know what's going to happen? You're going to get a crime reference number and then you're here diddly squat. Mm. Yeah. I think people do not have any confidence. Same, I, I think, you know, same thing with rape and things. Mm. Yeah. People feel going to the police is either going to be very, very traumatic or kind of pointless. Mm. And just yesterday we were talking about the, the absolute mushrooming of, of retail crime and shoplifting yeah. and so on. Which and is not even investigated, not yeah. even followed up. Yeah. Security guards who don't want to challenge people, so they don't, you know, they don't report. Yeah. What was it, 800 the... assaults on retail staff a day? Something yeah, like that, the, the biggest source of uh, incidents where the police have given up without identifying a suspect is theft. Yeah. yeah. But crime is down, but I believe that antisocial behaviour is up. Smashing windows, kids hanging yes, around. Yes, I'm not saying because we don't have police safer. on the street. Yeah, yeah. Because we don't have any police presence. We don't have we don't have a culture in which you're scared of a copper, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't do that, or in which local communities can say, look, for example, in my street, there's a spate of mobile phones just being nicked out of people's hands. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody knows the gang who's doing it, and the police won't just go round there. They won't just follow these young. They're just young lads. The they Emma, won't follow them. The Emma Wolf gang, I've heard it's of. The, I've heard of them. Is, <laughs> <laughs> I've got my little one onto it as well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, I mean, that shouldn't be going on in our communities when everybody knows and people are then scared or having their phones stolen or scared to take them but, out in the street, mm. you know? And that is a policy decision because there are more police now on the payroll. If they're not out there on the streets, that is a policy decision. It's not a reflection. Well, maybe they need funding. to do less diversity and painting rainbows onto their onto their police stations. <laughs> the Daily Mail make this very point. <laughs> more coppers, more coppers on the beat. Um, right, tornado. Uh, mm. Not you know, not not in the United States, but um, this is in England. Daily Express front page. Emma. Yeah, I mean, this is really quite startling. It is quite gusty out there. Um, but this tornado, Storm Garrett, is it Garrett or Garrett? Garrett, Garrett has yeah. been ripping through the country over, over the past few days. There's an amazing story on the front page of the Daily Express about this family, Gareth Moody and his family. You know, they were. it was 11.45 at night, and he heard this giant crash, I think that was Wednesday night, in his three-storey home in Greater Manchester. A chimney crashed through his son's bedroom, it could have been a serious loss of life. Extraordinary. And, you know, the that house was shaking, hurt. the winds were howling. Uh, or, as you say, around 100 homes were damaged. Um, and it was in this 160 twister. mile an hour wind. 160 <laughs> mile an hour wind. And really, if it had happened during the day, this kind of intensity, there could have been a serious loss of life. Mm. Um, but yeah, mm. stormy old Christmas. It's always been extraordinary. Terribly, terribly windy Christmas um, inside in my house, but that's too many Brussels sprouts. <laughs> well, thanks, hey, Will. Will. Thanks, Will. <laughs> well, we will get an update from the area a bit later on in the programme. We're going to uh, talk to our reporter um, to find out really what it was like. But as you said, astonishing that more people weren't uh, hurt. On the front of the eye, um, Rishi Sunak is being urged to speed up our transition to nuclear power. Great story, this one. You've got a bit of pantomime. You know, this is a rare public attack by Boris Johnson on Rishi Sunak. Not because the attacks are rare, but because normally because they're private <laughs> and even more vitriolic. But also, this is one of the issues of our times. Energy policy is cost of living, it is climate, and it's adjacent to foreign policy. Now, the issue is, Boris Johnson has set a target that we're going to get to 25% of our electricity coming from nuclear. Why? 
because this country was badly hit by the gas crisis. Mm -hmm. We are reliant on gas, not just to heat our homes, but also to generate electricity. So when the cost of gas went up tenfold because of what happened in the Ukraine, mm -hmm. we were left absolutely over a barrel. How do you solve that problem? How do you get away from gas? Part of the answer is you get towards renewables. Britain is world class in offshore wind. But what happens when the wind doesn't blow? The answer is low carbon base load. The answer is nuclear. Yeah. Britain, by the way, launched the first nuclear civil program in the world in 1956 in Cumbria. This is part of our heritage and we should be cracking on now. The problem is Rishi Sunak and the Energy Secretary Claire Coutinho have taken their eye off the ball. Lots of political games uh -huh. around gas and oil and drilling, yeah. and they haven't made the progress they should have made on Great British Nuclear. What's it takes? So what, eight to ten years to build a, a nuclear Exactly. Yeah. Which is why it's so important to have stories like this, which flag early mm. that, that uh, targets and milestones have been missed. Because if yeah. you don't do it early doors, you go from a 10-year project to a 15-year yeah. to 20-year project. Emma, yeah. France has been a massive success with this, yeah. and they produce their energy themselves, and they sell it abroad as well. And, and as a non-expert, why is it so controversial? I mean, I know we're always short-term in government. It's always yeah. thinking about money in the next, you know, four to five years mm. and not training nurses and then going, oh, we have no nurses yeah. and they take seven years, mm. whatever, doctors. But what's the controversy? What, what, why, why not well, say we're putting money into nuclear, they will be ready in seven to eight years? Well, there is an answer to that. So, so Britain's last nuclear site was developed in Suffolk and Sizewell. The reason, that was in the early 90s, the reason we cooled on stuff in the 1980s was Chernobyl. Mm. Huge, huge yes. nuclear PR crisis. Nuclear which just had a bad rep. It's yeah. had a bad rep, yeah. the yeah. PR and crisis. It sounds scary. Yeah. Decades to clean up. Now, that is changing now, partly because of necessity and net zero. This is not really about climate change. This is about getting lower bills and energy security. But we've had a big effort to clean up the PR of nuclear, including a documentary by Oliver Stone. Yeah. The guy who brought you the JFK conspiracy yeah. theories yeah. is now identifying, probably on slightly safer ground, the case for nuclear and why it's had such a bad press unfairly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would like to know what our viewers think about nuclear and see, you know, are you, are you convinced by Will's um, <laughs> promotion of nuclear? I mean, I am. I, I think, and, and as you said, everything changed with Ukraine in that it brought home to, to all of us the importance of energy security yeah. and how being reliant on you know, foreign imports was just a really stupid idea. Yeah. Look, if it's good enough for Homer Simpson, it's good enough for me. Right, let's come on. <laughs> Let, let's go from nuclear to fat dogs. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, front page, front page of the Star. Here we go. Who woofed all the pies, Emma? <laughs> yeah, well, this is a very cute one. I'm going to borrow your star because yes, I don't have yes, this yes, one. Yes. This is a very cute picture, uh, which I have to send to a friend, <laughs> of a doggy who looks like he's overindulged a little bit at Christmas. Um, mm. Apparently, dogs, um, as many as 73%, had so many treats that they now need to go on a diet. Sure. Well, 73%. I'm afraid my mother is a crime. She's a culprit in this, of feeding her dog and mine when he's staying. And she feeds them <laughs> crisps, which oh, is about yeah. the yes. worst thing. <laughs> it's like, one for me, one and for you. And you do that thing where you finish your Christmas dinner and then just put it on the floor and let the dog finish it off? Because I think they might be doing a lot of finishing off as well. It saves on the dishwasher, well. doesn't it? Yeah, so yeah, it does. yeah, yeah. We're talking about XL bullies later in the show, but I think this is just as, as bad. If, you're, but, if, you, if you can get in trouble for having a bad... Dog, an aggressive dog. If you're having a fat you dog... You think a fat dog is going to kill you. No, it's so too fat. <laughs> well, this, will, this will turn an XL bully into an XXL bully. Yeah. You're giving them the left yeah. But exactly. also, people are not exercising enough, so they're not walking their dogs enough. I think they need to get out and about after... Well, during Christmas, after Christmas, mm. and walk their dogs. Because yeah. dogs need exercise. And it is because our vet mm. always says, if you can't see from standing above a dog that it's got a waist, then it needs, <laughs> to, then it needs to go on a diet. Yeah, or if you can't um, see your toes. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If the, if the dog can't see... But a lot of people, you know, in, in lockdown, in the pandemic, you know, we know that the dog ownership went through the roof. And a lot of those people are inexperienced dog owners and don't realise how easy it is to make a dog very fat mm. and unhealthy. Yeah, look, if you... Am I, I think I'm the only dog owner here, aren't I? Yeah. yeah. And whistling. your dog is fat. You should be put in prison. <laughs> my fat dog, dog owner. is only fat. <laughs> A little bit because my mum feeds him crisps, which are really <laughs> unhealthy for dogs. <laughs> and she's going to be in trouble. Um, chaps, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to Emma and Will. They'll be back with more papers in just under an hour.